Well, thank you uh, for having me. This is my second time at WordCamp Pittsburgh, and I was telling him that last year I uh, didn't actually get to see Pittsburgh part of it. I just stayed like here. And so yesterday, Kevin took me downtown and showed, showed off Pittsburgh, and I get to catch a Pirates game tomorrow, so that'll be fun. This is Walter. Walter is a recent graduate, I say five years ago, graduate from uh, a local college. Uh, he got a degree in finance. Uh, he interned two summers uh, with a local financial planning agency, and shortly after graduation, they offered him a full-time job. He's been there for five years, loves his job, and in his spare time, uh, he likes to volunteer at the local animal shelter. Um, one day, he was sitting with, you know, the, the, how these small nonprofit organizations will work. There's the one person getting paid to be there, and then the five or six volunteers, uh, kind of in a semicircle around, and the boss looks around and says, Walter, you're the techiest person we've got. Can you make us a website? A little background on how techy Walter is. The most technical thing he's ever done is uh, added his company email to his cell phone, and he has an Amazon Prime account. So he's not a developer, but he agrees. Looking around the room, he's like, well, I do work on a computer every day, and sure, I'll give it a shot. So he downloads. Uh, well, the existing site is on WordPress, so he downloads a theme that says it works for animal shelters, and he sets about coding uh, to, uh, you know, tweaking the theme to try to make it work. Doesn't take long, he runs into an issue. He needs to move the header image like 20 pixels to the right because it's just not displaying correctly. And his first thought is, I'm not going to contact tech support. Why? Well, because tech support, I was saying earlier, tech support is uniquely among, um, I guess, fields, something where obviously otherwise talented, competent, uh, educated even people can be made to feel stupid, right? What's the point of the first person you talk to in tech support? To talk to the second person, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, can I speak to your manager? I need to be escalated to somebody who can actually fix my problem. And so Walter immediately, he, he just doubles down. He's like, I'm not going to play the game. I'm not going to do tech support. So he's like, I'm, not, I'm just not going to do it. And so he's, you know, Googling around trying to figure out how to do this, what should be relatively simple thing, and he's running up against all kinds of problems. And so fast forward five hours, he's still been doing this same simple task, can't get it to work, and he's lost, at this point, his ability to use words. So he's, he's become like a cave person. So when he does finally give in and submit a support ticket, it's like a cave person support ticket. Me, website broke, you fix, <laughs> header. Like, you know, like there's, there's no, it, it's just a, a no win for anyone. And so today what we're going to talk about is kind of the cheat codes for the game. Uh, the support game and so and why WordPress is a little bit different from uh, other tech support uh, that you might have received. Now for a slightly less fictional story. I graduated uh, from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill with a degree in religious studies. My focus was early American religious history which made me very qualified to have very intense conversations about the Amish, Mormons, Shakers, Quakers, itinerant snake handling preachers of the early 19th century. These are things that I can, I can hang in conversation with. What was curiously absent was any mention of websites or web technology. It was also 2002, so it would have been worthless to have learned all of that tech back then because it uh, wouldn't have translated much. But shortly after college, um, I was working for a large nonprofit, and my boss looked at me and just like with Walter said, you just got a new computer. Can you make us a website? which is fun because now we've come full circle and people say, oh, you make websites, can you fix my printer? <laughs> <laughs> These two things are not related. <laughs> it turns out the skill sets involved are completely unrelated, but in his defense, I did want to learn website development. And so I said, sure, I set about figuring out web stuff, right? And so I'm dabbling, doing the same sort of thing. I bought a premium theme that gave me access to their premium support channel and just kind of was trying to figure it out and banging my head against it, again, with no technical background. It was at that point that I was, you know, sitting there with my, my coffee and my laptop learning the hard way and writing really bad support tickets. <laughs> and so I've come from, from that to, to where we are now. Um, 
In fact, it was say, I guess fast forward, so that was 2010 that I started dabbling, you know, making websites. Fast forward to 2014, uh, I started using my degree, which I lovingly called pre-unemployment. I started using my degree in pre-unemployment uh, as uh, an unemployed person. Um, and I decided to double down on web stuff, like how, you know, what, what all happens from the browser all the way to the server and back. So I started learning all of the technologies that are there. And Linux, Apache, Nginx, it's spelled N-G-I-N-X, but you'll see, people will say Nginx. And uh, MySQL, which is spelled MySQL, but the geeks around here will call it MySQL. And so I started learning all of that and just kind of digging in, PHP, try to learn what, what these uh, technologies are. And I got enough freelance uh, work going uh, to, to support my family. And um, the, uh, I had a client who said, uh, she was a blogger. She needed those click-to-tweet boxes on her posts and pages. And she said, what's the best click-to-tweet plugin out there? Having just learned enough PHP to be dangerous, I went and read the source code in all of the existing options on the WordPress repository. And I found one that I kind of liked, but it was, the, the short version is it had not been updated to use the shortcode API because it had been written before the shortcode API. And so I thought, hey, I could, maybe fork that and, and write it using the shortcode API. And the name of that plugin was click to tweet And because I'm great at naming things, I named mine better click to tweet <laughs> and, um, and, But that, from the very beginning, I viewed better click to tweet as my resume. It was either going to get me more freelance gigs or it was going to get me a job. And so, um, and I also recognized, because I had had enough self-awareness uh, to know, I'm not the best developer out there. I don't think I'll ever be the best developer in the world, but I could make Better Click to Tweet the best supported plugin out there. And so I was maniacal about support. Uh, my wife knew that if my phone dinged during dinner and it was a support request for Better Click to Tweet, somebody having a problem, I was going to stand up and I was going to go and, and answer uh, the tickets. And so, because that was it, was, it was me viewing it as a resume. Um, it, the resume worked. I got a job with Give, which is the donation platform for WordPress. So it's like e-commerce, but there's no cart. People just give you money and it accepts the money and keeps track of it with donor management tools and things like that on the back end. Uh, my job with Give is senior uh, support technician. So I spend all day answering support tickets when people have issues or it breaks. We've got a wonderful customer success team that handles all of the, like, uh, licensing issues and you know my account doesn't work at givewp.com and all that kind of stuff so I'm freed up to spend all of my time just fixing it when it breaks on somebody's site and so that's the the other full circle that I've come from being the guy who asks really bad questions um, on support tickets to fielding much better questions because our customers are smarter than I was um, at the time so first a little bit about me that's my wife and you can't really see it because it's dark, but my wife and two of my kids, I also have a foster baby who, for obvious reasons, I can't put pictures of in uh, presentations like this, but if you want to see our 18-month-old foster baby, come find me after the talk and I will inundate you with photos. <laughs> You'll have to ask me to stop, for real. Um, but where we're gonna go, uh, oh, and I live in Cary, North Carolina, and I work 100% remote uh, for Give. Where we're gonna go today is three steps. The WordPress way and why that matters how not to do what I did, and then we'll end with the perfect support ticket. So, the WordPress way. This might feel like we're, we just took a side turn, right? Like, we're talking about support, and now you're gonna give me this philosophy. But I do think it really matters. Um, the mission of WordPress since the very beginning has been to democratize publishing. And what that means is, no longer do you have to be the editor of the New York Times to decide who gets a voice. No longer do you have to be the editor of Penguin Books to decide who gets a voice. Um, it's a, a decentralization of the authority structure. We've, we put you as the authority on who gets to say things because you can download this software, spin it up on a server somewhere, and you know, publish to the masses. And that makes for really great things to happen in, in terms of democratization, but it makes support really hard because we decentralize the authority structures. There's no one person who you can contact who can control your theme, your plugins, your hosting environment, 
your the, the third party scripts and other things that are bundled within themes. There's, there's no authority that can handle all of those things except for you. So when you submit a support ticket to me uh, with Give or me with Better Click to Tweet, I can't, you know, uh, my hands are somewhat tied uh, when it comes to how I can help you. And so what makes WordPress great is that you are in control. If you think of WordPress like an airplane, you are the pilot and the owner of the airplane. At best, I'm like a flight mechanic or a flight attendant or maybe an air marshal. <laughs> you know, like that's, that's the best I can get in that metaphor in terms of, like I'm, I might even take over the controls as the flight mechanic, right? You know, okay, we got it straightened out and got the thing to stop wiggling. But at the end of the day, I'm gonna give you your seat back and you're gonna be the pilot again of your website. So I often heard, and you still see it somewhere or some places in the WordPress ecosystem, people will say things like WordPress is easy. WordPress is easy, and it is. WordPress is easy, like flying a plane is easier than building a plane. There, there that is. WordPress is easy, like flying a plane is easier than building a plane. There's still a learning curve, right? <laughs> There's, you're gonna need to cut yourself some slack. You know, it's not, nobody has ever, you know, with no additional tutorial, sat down and flown a plane perfectly for the first time. Maybe try a musical metaphor. WordPress is easy like playing piano is easier than making a piano. Nobody's accidentally played Beethoven's second concerto, you know, by heart the first time they sat down at a piano. It's, but it's way easier than starting from, with no piano and having to build one. <laughs> and so WordPress has built you this CMS or this tool for your blogging or whatever it is you're using it for, but doing the, the advanced stuff, um, especially technical stuff, is gonna take some, some learning. So cut yourself some slack. That's point number one if you're taking notes. Cut yourself some slack. I want you to imagine a young couple. It's recently following their wedding. They go on the honeymoon. They come back. Uh, the husband develops a, a nasty habit. So he, he likes to work out in the morning and then head to work. So he comes home after working out, showers, changes clothes, goes to work. Well, in his haste to get to work, he begins throwing, he's aiming for the hamper with his dirty, gym, sweaty gym socks. He's aiming for the hamper, but he keeps missing and hitting her side of the bed, and it lands like on the pillow up, up next to her side of the bed. So the first time it happens, right, they have these cutesy little early in marriage fights where it's like <laughs> passive aggressive, oozy boozy, you know, yeah. We've, if you're married, you've been there. Um, but as time, thing, time goes on, um, he continues to make this mistake over and over. And so as these things tend to do, it escalates. And so he becomes, uh, the, the cutesy little early marriage fight becomes something more serious. And he vows to do better and he does better. And then it, again, as these things tend to do, he falls back into the bad habits. And so now fast forward a year, two years down the road, she blows up at him one day because he's doing it again, right? And he's like, whoa, we need marriage counseling. And she just laughs. She's like, we don't need marriage counseling. We need you to stop leaving your sock on my side of the bed. Like, um, and she's like, if you want to go to marriage counseling, fine, have at it, but I'm not going. And so he does. He books an appointment at the, the most expensive, high, highest rated marriage counselor in town. And when he gets there, he sits down and crosses his arms. And the, the, the marriage counselor says, so what brings you in today? He says, my wife blew up at me for no reason. Now, I don't care if this guy is the Michael Jordan of marriage counseling. He's not going to get to the real reason from that first response to that first question. I want you to view support for your WordPress website like finally taking your relationship with your website to counseling. And your website doesn't talk. <laughs> your website's not there to, to, to say what's going on. And so where my analogy thoroughly falls apart is he paid for an hour of marriage counseling, so there's gonna be some back and forth, right? There's gonna be like some follow-up questions. In the WordPress support world, especially email support, the more back and forth you get, the more frustrated the user is going to get. And the support technician, in most cases, is going to get more and more frustrated. And so, if you view this as a counseling appointment, the more information you can front load the conversation with, the better. Uh, and like Walter from our, our story earlier, 
if you if you've already become a cave person, <laughs> me website broken, you fix. Like you gotta you gotta still dial that back and come up with some things. I'll actually show you what the the cave person response looks like from my end when I get it. Now I've both sent this this exact ticket and I've received this exact ticket. So this is not me casting stones at the person who has sent this, but this is exactly what that website or that ticket looks like. It's broken, please fix. <laughs> right? I bought your theme and I expected it to do this and it doesn't. Fix it. <laughs> you know? And there's one more that might, from a, from a support tech side, might be even more frustrating, but it's tricky. It's similar. I read all the docs and it's still broken. Please fix. Because you know you're playing the game, right? His first question is going to be, have you turned it off and turned it back on? His second question is going to be, have you read the documentation? And his third, so you're skipping steps. And Okay, I read the docs and it's still broken. Please fix. This one's really close to being a great support ticket. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this comma right here and we're going to add four paragraphs after it. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you what to put in those four paragraphs to make it a great support ticket because that is really, really close. And if you have read the docs and the docs are not right, this will help with that. If you have read the docs and you missed the step, this, the next four steps will have, help with that. So here's the four things that you need to include after that first comma. What you were trying to do, what specific steps you took, what you expected to happen, and what happened instead. Now, number one and number three, sounds like the same question, right? Uh, I was trying to do this thing that I just told you I'm trying to do. I expected it to happen. But it's important that you ask them in this order and you answer them in this order because of what happens mentally, and we'll get into that. But a lot of times what'll happen for me is it'll become a loop. What I was trying to do is this. I took this specific step. I expected this to happen, but because I answered this question, I'll say to myself, well, you dummy, how did you expect this to happen if this is the step you took? And so then I'd go back and start over again mentally. Okay, I did this. And, and what they call this in the developer community is rubber ducking. And this is the first of three things that could happen from you submitting a great support ticket. Rubber duck debugging, I don't know who came up with the concept, but it's a concept of literally putting a literal rubber duck. I have a plush toy, it's a WordCamp Wapu from uh, WordCamp US a couple of years ago, and it sits on my desk. I kind of give him new names every time I do this procedure, so I should probably pick a name. But anyways, there's, there's a literal duck on the desk, and you use your words, I'm a dad, so I can say things like use your words. You use your words to explain to the duck and developers do it with, with our code. So I'm reading lines of code. I'm like, on line one, duck, I expect this to happen. So I did this, and it calls this function, which does this on this line. And you, with your words, you tell the duck what happened. What happens is the duck solves the problem a lot of times. And if, you, if you've ever explained something to someone, or if you've ever been a teacher, you know what's going on here. You're using a different part of your brain. It's like a out-of-body experience, you're using a different part of your brain when you explain something than you are when you do something. And so you'll see in those three steps, or the first three steps, oh, I didn't take this specific step. I should have done this thing. And so you'll, you'll resolve the problem. And so it works the exact same way for support tickets. When you're submitting a support ticket, if you, you're typing it out and you're saying, I did this, and uh, using this, I did this, and pointing to specific lines in the documentation. On your website, you say, do this. And so on my website, I did this. And you, li you walk through it, and I can't tell you how many tickets I've started, but never submitted because I solved the problem. And that, I'd say it's upwards of 50% of the tickets that I start these days because I follow these steps in my own life when I'm having a tech support issue. I solve the problem because I, I rubber duck it. So that's, that's the first thing that can happen. You can rubber duck your problem. The second thing that can happen is you can show me your golf swing. Now, he mentioned earlier that I prefer to call it ball golf, but for the sake of the, the argument, we'll say, uh, if I go to a golf pro and I show her my swing, and I'm like, this is how I swing, she's immediately going to, because she's a golf professional, tell me like 13 things I'm doing wrong. Well, you're raising your head and this back arm is all over the place and your wrists, I don't even know what's going on. Like she's gonna immediately be able to tell me 10 things probably that I'm doing wrong in my golf swing. In this analogy, 
I'm the golf instructor as a so support technician. Um, what, what is it about being a golf pro that makes you able to analyze other people's golf swings? Well, you've done it more, right? In fact, not only have you analyzed other people's golf swings, you've hit more balls into more lakes than the average human. And so, as a support professional, what makes me a support professional for websites is that I've broken more websites than you, and in more spectacular ways. In fact, I've broken Give specifically, or better click to tweet specifically, in some fancy ways. Like I've brought down entire websites, production websites, with just a semicolon. Like I, I, I've broken lots and lots of websites. And so when you come to me and say, well, I took this PHP code snippet, I put it in the post editor, I clicked publish, and nothing happened. I'm immediately going to be able to answer that question. And some of you heard it too. PHP code snippets don't go in the post editor. It strips out PHP when you click publish and it's doing nothing. And so it's not going to do anything to put PHP code snippets there. So if you come with me, come to me with those three steps and say, I did this, this, and this, I've got like a, a 30 second reply to it. It's actually four or five paragraphs that I can type out with a key text expander thing that expands out and shows you how using some different documentation on our site, this is how PHP code snippets work and walks you through the whole process. But only because you gave me a lot of detail was I able to do it. The same sentence without that one clause in there, I put it in the post editor. If you say, I got this code snippet on your website and I tried it on my site and it doesn't work, I gotta be a little bit of a detective and figure out what's, what's going on or how it broke um, versus the more detail you give a support technician, the better because they're gonna be able to, to immediately see your golf swing so that's the two things so far, there's three. Um, you could either rubber duck it, you could show me your golf swing, or finally, you could um, help make the documentation better. In 1990, uh, Elizabeth Newton, the story is in the book Made to Stick by Chip and Dan Heath is where I read this story. It's a fantastic book if you haven't read it. They tell the story of Elizabeth Newton she was a PhD student at the time, I think it was 1990, uh, the University of Stanford. She did a, what became a groundbreaking study where she took two groups of people and she put them, uh, one group she called the tappers and one group she called the listeners. The tappers were given the name of a melody that everybody in the listener group would know. So think Jingle Bells, Happy Birthday to You, something, a song that everybody over here knew. The tappers were given the name of that melody and told to tap the melody on the table. Can't hum it, can't sing it, can't whistle it. Just tap the melody on the table. So for example, jingle bells would be. Right, you all heard it. And so before they did that, they were asked to guess how many of the listeners would get it right. Just estimate, they, they'd already seen the name of the song and then the listeners looking at them. And they were asked to guess how many, what percent they thought would get it right. They guessed 50%. They said 50% of the time they're going to be able to get this melody. Well, what happened was 2% of the time the listeners got it right. It was later termed the curse of knowledge. And what that means is it's impossible once you know the melody to separate that melody out and to remember what it was like to not know the melody. And so when the listener, the, the listener, or the tappers rather, were estimating the other people's intelligence on the other end of the thing, what they were mis misunderstanding was their own bias, their own blind spot, um, if you will. And so that's the, the, um, the, when I write my documentation on betterclicktotweet.com or at givewp.com, when I'm writing documentation, that's me tapping on the table. And I've forgotten what it's like to not know how to install a plugin, for example or to uh, in any number of advanced topics that I, all of the ways that I've broken give, I've forgotten what it was like to not know that. All of the ways that I've broken, you know, different plug-in conflicts and things like that. And so when I'm writing documentation, I need listeners to explain my tapping, to help me see there's a big blind spot there. So if you do a great job and give me those four points, I looked at this documentation on your website and I did this, and it says here that I need to go to this link and do this, and I did that, and then I look at it and go, oh, that's wrong. <laughs> I need to fix that, you know, because tech changes, you know, Stripe makes a change or PayPal makes a change, and I have to go in and edit my documentation to fix that. So that's the three things that can happen and, and do happen often. Um, 
is you can rubber duck the problem and solve it yourself. You can show me your golf swing and I can immediately solve it. Or you can uh, help, my, help me make my documentation better. So I didn't have a spot for these last three tips. Um, so I just stuck them in here. First tip, all caps is yelling. Don't yell. <laughs> um, tangentially related to this, profanity does not actually get your ticket answered faster. Um, in fact, I take WTF and I translate it to why this first and I move it back here and, <laughs> and I answer your question very professionally later. You get put in time out. Again, I'm a father. We don't use that kind of language around here. And so just be nice. It's a general principle, but you know, all caps is yelling. I know you're frustrated. I've been frustrated before. I've probably done the same thing you've done before and I've done the all caps ticket and I shouldn't have. Second uh, point, never send your credentials, your username and password to log into WordPress. Your credentials, never send them via email to a support technician, ever. Your password should only live in your password manager or your brain and it should never be sent to another person because WordPress has a built-in way to send people credentials. Go to add new user, add a new user, make them an administrator and send that potentially via email. What we do in Give is we have you create a one-time secret URL. It's called onetimesecret.com. And you put in the credentials into that little box. It creates a one-time use URL. So the first time anybody anywhere clicks on that link, they see it and then it's gone forever. It, they, won't, they don't keep it. And so you can send that through there because then once the support technician fixes your problem, you can just delete that whole user account and your website is secure and your password has never been compromised. So never, ever, 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 ever send your own password via email. And the last point, um, if you paid less than $1,000 for the solution that you are currently seeking support for, <laughs> I would expect about a business day turnaround. Um, so what happens is you submit one ticket and then two hours later you haven't gotten a response so you submit another ticket from the support technician side. Now I have two tickets waiting for me which is more mentally overwhelming than having one ticket waiting for me. So take that for this word. Now give, we advertise two to four business hours response time and we generally keep to that but I think that's weird. Um, I think that community wide a good standard would be uh, one business day turnaround. So I told you at the beginning that we would be talking about the perfect support ticket and then I kind of spoiled my own ending. So now I'll tell you the myth of the perfect support ticket, right? There is, the reason there is no perfect support ticket in WordPress is there's no perfect audience for that support ticket. There's no one that I can send the perfect ticket to. So therefore, there, there's no such thing as a perfect ticket. You are the pilot of your WordPress site. You are the owner of your WordPress site. And so you're the one that, uh, that needs, uh, you're the audience there. I never knew in 2008 or 2010 uh, when I was steeped in uh, early American religious history that I was making a career transition the first time I submitted a support ticket on that premium support theme. But what happened uh, when I look at it in retrospect is uh, pretty easy to spot. I got roped in by WordPress. You see, WordPress is not just the software that powers whatever percent, I think it's up to 32% of the internet. WordPress is people. WordPress is a community and the people in this room, the people in this building uh, with the name tags on and the people around the world at other WordCamps is uh, the WordPress community. And I could have made this talk much, much shorter, like a minute and a half, and I'm going to close with that minute and a half. Uh, the way that you get better support in WordPress is to keep in mind that you are WordPress. And so when you're submitting a ticket, you're not submitting it to some nameless, faceless other on the other end of the internet. You're submitting a ticket to your people. Um, and so when you treat them like that and when you give, when you do good support tickets and, and understand uh, the role of support in the community, I think it makes that product better. Uh, it makes WordPress in general better. And it makes the world better, honestly. My name is Ben Meredith. I'm the senior support technician at GiveWP and thanks so much for having me. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. From a support end, is it easier following
following your formula for someone to send like screen grabs or a short video rather than trying to explain it in words? Because I think sometimes when we try to explain it in words, we think that we're telling you all the steps <laughs> we took, but we really aren't. Yeah, I, de I definitely think video is super helpful. Um, Oh yeah, I need to repeat the question for the, the camera. Uh, so the, the question is, is it better for, uh, from a support technician side for the user to submit video or screen captures or uh, et cetera? And I think the answer is absolutely, as much as you can. Um, some support ticket systems won't let you submit more than one image or something like that, so make it a good one. Um, <laughs> but yeah, linking to a, a screencast of it, of you, I can't, every single time I've ever done a screen share call with a customer from Better Click to Tweet or from Give, and I'm walking them through, click here, now click here, okay, go over here. I learned something new about how someone who's not familiar with Give uses our software, or someone who's not familiar with Better Click to Tweet uses the software. So the more detail I can get, the better. It absolutely helps. And so, um, yeah, making a short, I use uh, Screencast-O-Matic. I think as long as it's less than 15 minutes, it's free. Um, and so I use that. Oftentimes there's other tools out there uh, that you can, you can use to do um, short screencasts and, and show the technician what you're doing. And I think that's, any, any extra detail is helpful, for sure. Other questions? Comments, snide remarks? How do you reduce back and forth after your first? Yeah. First yeah, the, I make it my goal Oh, repeat the question. How do I how do I stop or reduce as much as I can the back and forth between um, me and the the person getting support, the customer, um, as much as possible? I think for me, I make it my goal that they can never respond with, "Okay, I tried that. What next?" And so, if I if I'm having a especially difficult time, if I can't immediately spot the problem and say, "Okay, this is a conflict with this other plugin," and here's the workaround to fix it from our side, and uh, we've escalated this to our development team, and we'll get back to you, you know, that kind of stuff. If I can't give them that, and I'm not sure what's going on, either they didn't give me enough information, or the information that they gave me still doesn't get me to a resolution, I never want them to be able to say. Okay, I tried that, what next? Because that's a wasted back and forth. And so I'm, my response often ends with in situations like that. And if none of that works, here's the way to send me credentials, to create credentials for your website. And then I'm happy to hop in and duplicate your site. We use um, Duplicator, to, it's a plugin to clone their site. And I pull it to my local computer and spin up a test install with their stuff and replicate the problem. Our philosophy at Give, and I think it's a really good one, is we don't want to make you do work that we could do for you because we've done it before and we're better at it. If I tell you to duplicate your site to a staging environment, I've just completely overwhelmed some users. Uh, versus if I say to you, can I get some credentials to log in? What I'm gonna do is replicate your site, isolate the bug, find a fix for it, and message you back. People are often very thankful for that. And so that reduces the back and forth too. But I think the more education you can do helps as well. So instead of telling a user, you know, these 27 steps that, to follow, um, if I can say to them, okay, the reason, uh, the way your site is working versus how it's supposed to work, it can only be this, this, or this that's wrong. So we're gonna isolate which of these three options are wrong and just explaining to the user, you know, it's like a, a, a sniper rifle instead of a shotgun. Like some support technicians, and I've done this in the past too, will just sort of blast you with like, have you deactivated all the plugins and done all of this and done all of that? And you're just overwhelmed with, why would I want to deactivate all of my plugins? Like, and so if I instead give you, here's, the, here's how we're gonna isolate this problem. And so very quickly go in, deactivate this plugin, this plugin, and this plugin, because I think it's one of those three. Um, and so then the user feels empowered and educated. And so they're not gonna come back with, I tried that, now what next? Because I, I try to not let them do that. So I, I really want to 
um, it's my job to fix the site, you know. And I, I take ownership even when it's another plugin. Um, I go into their code and find the line and say, this is what you need to send to the support technician at this plugin. That on line 29 of this file, this variable was being called incorrectly and it's interfering with give. And then we try to fix it from our side as much as we can, but sometimes it requires some interplay between us and the, the other uh, company. Other questions? So if, if you find out that it is maybe a conflict with another plugin or a thing, you try to give them as much information as you can mm -hmm. to send them to say, here's what you need to do next. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll give it a caveat. I'm like, the following three paragraphs are total geek speak that I want you to translate, you know, pass on to the other, the other developer and I'll, you know, go, go all in on the, the geek language to explain the specific conflict and why and, you know, it's a PHP version issue or it's whatever and send this and kind of giving them a script to hand to either their host or their plugin or theme or whoever else. And I, you know, because the decentralization of authority that happens in WordPress is, is what it is, you know, I have to couch it with, you know, I might not be able to fix this in some cases because if this plugin is a deal breaker for you and they don't fix this issue, it's not gonna play nicely with Give and so, or with better click to tweet whatever. So I do though try to give them as much as I possibly can to, um, to, because they're not they're not developers. They don't need to know why it's broken necessarily. They just need somebody to fix it. And if I can't fix it, I need to give the person who can fix it as much info as I can. So a follow-up question to that. Sure. If you go out of your way to do this, what happens if you're contacting support and they don't do that? So the question is, what happens if I uh, if a user contacts support and that support technician doesn't go? out of their way to uh, resolve the problem and you know maybe punts it off to another you know blame the the host or blame the caching or blame you know blame somebody else instead of that and honestly I don't have a great answer for that other than you know don't do business with people that don't support their product um, you know and I think the part of the ethos of the open source community is if it's a free WordPress repository, you know, the free plugin directory plugin or theme, it's open source. You know, we can all go in and we can all as development teams see the source, but there's only one person who can commit changes in some cases to these, you know, the plugins that have been abandoned or whatever. So you kind of got to use some discretion there. You know, the fact that it is open is great, and but if it stops working, you've still got somebody who's got to fix it. Um, and so if, you, if you're not a coder, you need to get somebody who is to fix it or whatever. There's not, I guess, an easy answer to that question other than it's why, it's why some cert certain plugins are more popular than others is because their, our support goes out of our way to fix it as much as we can. Thank you. Anybody else? Are we over time? Oh, one more. Similar related to this conversation of empowering the WordPress community, do you have any, like, something that you would say to other support, supporters that are uh, trying to be better with this kind of thing? Anything like that? Sure. To engage in? Maybe yeah. So the question is, do I have anything that, any advice that I would give for other people who are providing support for products or services within WordPress? First, that would be a whole different talk and it would be really fun. So I would like to do that one. Um, but the biggest thing, and I was talking about this before we started, was that support technicians have to try really hard because we don't remember what it was like to not know how to do the things that we know how to do. Um, and it is not a sign that someone is unintelligent that they can't figure out how to do a technical thing. It's a sign that they're ignorant and ignorance and lack of intelligence are two completely different things. <laughs> it's being uninformed versus being, you know, dumb and not willing to learn or something. And so if I were giving this talk to support technicians, my main point would be treat the person on the other end of the support ticket like an intelligent human who just needs to know. We, ha we call it the wise friend method and so like when somebody messages me with an issue, I think, what would I tell my friend 
if my friend came to me with this exact issue, well, I wouldn't talk to them like they were an idiot, first of all, right? I wouldn't be like, well, the reason that this is happening is because the PHP version on your site is crap, and this is crap, and you're crap. You know, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I would instead put my arm around them and say, hey, here, this is, I've done that before. I made that mistake. Here's how we fix this. And so um, we, we have a whole, uh, an, an, an internal tone guide that soon will be published externally, but um, that the whole point is to that we are the wise friend. We're their advocate with the development team. We're their advocate with, and we're the development team advocate to the customer. You know, the development team doesn't deal day in and day out with customers who are frustrated with this issue or this ish, lack of issue or whatever. And so my role is kind of a jelly in between the two to be able to translate in both directions. And so I would tell support technicians that they need to treat people on both sides with respect and and to to really give them uh, education. If you're not if you're not don't have the heart of a teacher, you won't make a very good support technician because that's what I do all day is teach people how to use a product. It happens to be the same product over and over and over, um, and so I'm getting really good at teaching people how to use it um, because uh, just with practice. But yeah, I would say heart of a teacher and treat, treat people with respect and answer them how you would answer a friend, even the angry ones. Because like I said in the first story when I started out, you know, by the time most people come to support tech, what they're expecting is to be made to feel dumb. And so they come out defensively and they come out aggressively sometimes and they're angry. And especially in the case of Give, we've got, you know, sites that where they're getting twenty, thirty thousand dollars in donations a month and it just went down because they clicked update and something broke and their boss doesn't give a rip about PHP or MySQL or whatever, the site is down. <laughs> and so they come to me and they're lashing out at me. And so what good does it do for me to defend myself? No. If my friend came to me with that issue, I would want to solve it as quickly as possible and that'll change their tone. You know, you gotta, you gotta have thick skin as a support technician and um, not take insults personally because people do, um, especially in e-commerce, they're going to get frustrated. And so treating them with respect and saying, you know, with here's the three things that could be causing that, you know, let's isolate that and fix it as fast as we can um, is, is the way to go about it. There's uh, one last question. Anybody has one? One more question. How do you diffuse someone who is coming at you hot? So the question is how to defuse someone who's coming at you hot. Well, first you ignore the fact that they're coming at you hot. If they say, you're stupid and this is the worst product ever and, you know, your mom was a whatever, in the, in the ticket, but they also say, my site was doing this and now it's doing this and now it's doing this. And if they've given me enough information to, you know, my natural response, my, my personality, if you're into Myers-Briggs, I'm an ENTP, which is the debater, right? And so my internal response to that, and sometimes external, um, is to prove them wrong. Like, I'll give you a five-point outline of how I'm not dumb and our product is not stupid. And, you know, like, we've got this many customers are doing this many things, and it's your problem. You're dumb. You know, like, <laughs> like, that doesn't help, right? And so the skill that I'm learning and I have learned over time is you just really have to solve a problem because that changes tones immediately. If, if, if I say, actually, and, and I just ignore it, you know, just come at them with the same tone I would if they had not used the F-bomb. Um, you know, just say, hey, here's, when that happens on sites, here's the four reasons why it normally does. It's either this, 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 or this. I can isolate these three from my side so I see that it's probably this. If you try doing this, it'll fix it. Let me know if that doesn't work. If it doesn't, I'm happy to hop in and take care because they're they're expecting me to blame another plugin or all of the stuff with the support game. They're expecting to have to talk to my manager. They don't know that I'm the manager. Um, they, you know, they they don't need that. That me defending myself is just a waste of time. And so, um, and sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. I'd say 90% of the time it does work if you solve their problem they'll come back and say, you know what, I was kind of a jerk. My boss was breathing down my neck and I really appreciate you not taking it personally. I've had that happen dozens of times now um, versus, you know, some, in, and then the other 10% of the time they just leave and they're angry and I can't. You get the, you get the poor rating, the right. great rating. 
<laughs> yes, <laughs> we use Help Scout, and so they'll click, you know, bad rating, and it comes up with a bad rating. And then 15 minutes later, after I've solved their problem, they, they click great rating, and I'm like, yes. <laughs> you know, it's like, you don't even have to apologize, friend. I know, I know you're sorry. <laughs> I know you feel bad. You don't, you don't have to come back. And so, yeah, I think the the key skill for support technicians is not taking it personally. They're they're mad at. A lot of times they're mad at themselves, and I've been there too. I, you know, I am so dumb, I can't figure out how to do this one thing, and now my site's down and my boss is mad, and the CEO's tweeting at me, and you know, like, yeah, you know, I wanna fix it. And so empathy, putting myself into their shoes and realizing they're upset and with good reason um, because they thought, you know, even though it was not technically my fault, I can still fix their problem and make their day. And those are my favorite great ratings in the whole world. Well, second favorite. My favorite great ratings are the ones when I say, no, we can't do that. <laughs> They'll say, can you do this, this, or this? And I'll say, no, we can't do that. You have to hire a third party developer to do that. But I say it in such a way that they still give me a great rating. That's my favorite <laughs> great rating. <laughs> that's a skill. And, and I'm learning. <laughs> I really, that's fun. That's my favorite challenge is to say no in a way that they're like, well, that was great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but my second favorite is the person who was angry and then gives me a great rating at the end of the uh, thing. That's easier than saying no in such a way. I think parenting comes into it a lot. Uh, you never thought you were, one of my tweets from years ago, I said, I never thought I was good at sales and marketing until I got both kids to eat a tofu hot dog and like it. Like, I did that one time because I accidentally bought the tofu hot dogs and I wasn't gonna let them go to waste because nobody's gonna do that. So. You gotta spin it, man. You gotta make it sound like a positive. <laughs> and once it sounded good to them, they ate it and liked it. And then I told them it was tofu, and then they went, Aah! Well, thank y'all so much for having me. Thank you.